All right, everybody. Welcome back to another episode here at Whiteboard Medicine. We appreciate you checking it out. Hope everybody's having a good day. We are coming off a handful of shifts, both uh, in the intensive care unit and then followed by a couple ED shifts as well. Um, we actually had a interesting and unexpected case uh, in elderly gentleman came in, uh, minimally responsive, hypotension, hypotensive febrile, warm to the touch, um, not volume overloaded, uh, screamed. If I could just take a quick 60 seconds of your time, I wanted to introduce our newest whiteboard medicine emergency and critical care community, and that is our Patreon community. Here we post emergency and critical care medicine medical education topics every other day. We focus on landmark trials, new trials, clinical pearls, bedside tips and tricks, and much more. Everything emergency and critical care. We also upload study guides for each video. We have practice tests. And our newest edition is going to be mini courses that kind of lay out video study guides, practice questions um, into an easily digestible form that we hope is very applicable and helpful to the bedside. Our goal is to try to get even 1% of our YouTube community to join our Patreon community. It would be incredibly helpful in allowing us to spend more time creating content and elevating our current content. We appreciate you all and we hope to see many of you there. Septic shock, POCUS, Tim, IVC small and collapsible, cardiac function, hyperdynamic, volume resuscitated, still ended up needed, significant pressors. Um, he was in three pressor shock, profound vasoplegia, high lactic acid, broad spectrum antibiotics, whole pan scan. Uh, didn't really find a definitive source of infection. And then it uh, turns out a day later, his blood culture grew up pasturella. And on closer inspection, there were some like scratches or scrapes on one of his legs that at the time didn't really look erythematous or indurated, but slowly over the next day or two became more erythematous indurated with the running theory being, you know, a cat or dog or something scratched him and he got pasturella bacteremia. Um, so interesting case, you know, interesting things pop up. I remember being a little uh, befuddled and uh, unsure what his source was. You know, you do all the hedge, like urine looked, you know, indeterminately dirty and maybe there was a little left lower lobe something that could be pneumonia, but it was probably just atelectasis or aspiration or what have you. So um, yeah, you never know what's going to grow out on those cultures. That's why we start broad, um, even when we're not entirely sure what's going on in those sick patients. But anyways, today we're going to be talking about pulse pressure variation. This is actually requested by one of you, so we always appreciate when you give us some great requests within the emergency critical care lane, and we wanted to make sure we got that out there. So pulse pressure variation, we'll be talking about what it is and the physiology behind it. We'll talk about how to measure pulse pressure variation. We'll talk about the calculation, uh, the formula. We'll talk about um, how, kind of best practices when you are calculating it, how to use it, strengths, pitfalls, uh, evidence, and then we'll go into a couple practice questions. This study guide, as with all of our study guides, will be uploaded onto our Patreon page. Um, so if you want to access it, definitely check that out. Lots of good stuff on there, ad-free videos, practice questions, kind of uh, clinical debriefs, medical education posts multiple times a week. So we're trying to really buff up that community, and we'd love for you to check it out. So check it out if you're thinking about it. Uh, no further ado, pulse pressure variation. All right, what is pulse pressure variation? What's the physiology behind it? Well, the definition of pulse pressure Pulse pressure variation is the respiratory cycle induced variation in an arterial pulse pressure. And we're going to tease that out a little bit more. Um, do note that mechanically ventilated patients uh, are what makes this accurate. So spontaneously breathing patients, this measurement is not really accurate, even if we want it to be. Um, and there's lots of kind of uh, parameters that are necessary to really use this in a meaningful way. We'll get into it all. But yeah, it's the variation in the arterial pulse pressure during the respiratory cycle. Why does this happen? Why does this make sense? What is actually going on? Well, the physiology here is that when you get a positive pressure breath, and that's what a ventilator is giving you, right? Ventilator pumps air in. It's a positive pressure breath. It increases intrathoracic pressure. And that increase in intrathoracic pressure is going to cause compression on the vena cava and decrease the amount of venous return to the right side of the heart. That is going to then decrease right ventricular filling. This makes sense, right? Increased intrathoracic pressure compresses the vena cava, less blood goes to the right side of the heart, and you have decreased right ventricular filling. After a few beats, that decreased right ventricular filling, which is going to go from the right ventricle to the pulmonary vasculature, 
and then into the left atrium, left ventricle. After a few beats, you're going to have a decrease in your left ventricular preload as well, right? Because you had less right ventricular filling. So then you're going to have less left ventricular filling, which is going to decrease your stroke volume and pulse pressure. Expiration then does the opposite, right? The breath goes out. That's going to decrease your intrathoracic pressure. That's going to increase your venous return, increase your right ventricular filling pressure. After a few beats, that'll then increase your or left ventricular preload, and that will increase your stroke volume. So this respiratory cycle-induced variation is going to lead to differences in the arterial pulse pressure. When a patient has significant pulse pressure variation or big swings in their pulse pressure, that essentially means the ventric ventricles are operating on kind of that steep part of the Frank Starling curve, right? If you're hypovolemic, the decreased venous return is going to be more significant with your increase in intrathoracic pressure, right? The pipe's got less fluid in it. When you increase that intrathoracic pressure, you're going to get more compression on the vena cava and much less right ventricular filling than if you're volume overloaded, even when you increase the intrathoracic pressure, you know, your volume overloaded, those pipes are really filled. There's got kind of high intravascular pressures. So you're not going to change the right ventricular filling that much. So when you're hypovolemic, you're going to see bigger swings in the pulse pressure with the respiratory cycle, and that is pulse pressure variation. So high or significant pulse pressure variation often implies you're going to be fluid responsive. And the fluid responsive portion is built in there because you're kind of looking at fluid responsiveness a little bit. You can almost think of it like a fluid challenge to some degree, right? When you um, give a breath and you decrease the amount of fluid going to the heart, if the blood pressure drops, you know that decrease in fluid to the heart, decrease in right ventricular filling leads to lower blood pressures. And as such, increased fluid is going to increase right ventricular filling and lead to higher blood pressures. And that's kind of like a fluid responsive challenge right then and there. So this is a measurement of fluid responsiveness in a patient. But how do you measure it? Well, measurement here uh, it depends on a number of variables that need to all kind of be aligned for it to be accurate. Number one, the patient has to be on mechanical ventilation and they cannot have spontaneous respiratory effort. So even if the patient's intubated, if they're breathing like a racehorse in there 35 times per minute, your pulse pressure variation is going to be inaccurate. So they have to be on mechanical ventilation without spontaneous effort. They need to be in a regular sinus rhythm. They can't be in AFib with RVR. They can't be in SVT. They can't be in A flutter. They have to be in regular sinus rhythm. And you really should have them on a tidal volume of at least eight cc's per kg ideal body weight. We don't do this a lot, right? We kind of target six cc's per kg, somewhere in the six to eight range. And this is not necessarily a magic number. If they're on seven cc's per kg, you probably can still do pulse pressure variation. But if they're on five or six or very low tidal volumes, you might not be able to get an accurate measure. And we'll talk about this thing called the tidal volume challenge, which essentially is if you think their lungs can tolerate it, you can increase the tidal volume just for you know a handful of heartbeats to look at the pulse pressure variation, and then go back down on the tidal volume. And then just normal things, right? They have to have a closed chest. If they have an open chest, you're not actually building up intrathoracic pressure. They have to be stable. They have to have adequate vent settings. You have to have a good arterial line tracing because you're looking at the arterial line to do this. So lots of kind of caveats to accuracy. And there's more than this. This is just kind of the beginning number. So controlled ventilation, no spontaneous effort, regular rhythm, around 8 cc's per kg of tidal volume, um, and then closed chest. How do we actually calculate it? We've decided they fit all those criteria. Let's calculate it. Well, what we actually need to do is we need to look at the arterial waveform, and we need to look at the pulse pressure max and the pulse pressure min, okay? And the pulse pressure max is going to be the highest pulse pressure, which is systolic blood pressure minus diastolic blood pressure. And the pulse pressure min is going to be the lowest, right? So you have your arterial line waveform. It's going to be something like this. This is not a good one. There's your dichrotic notch. We've had a, we've done a whole bunch of episodes on A-lines. You can check those out if this is confusing. Um, but your systolic and diastolic pressures. So let's, I guess, um, let's change the waveform so that we can look at a pulse pressure. I'll go back up. I'll go back down. So like systolic max, diastolic, uh, sorry, systolic minus diastolic max, 
systolic minus diastolic min, right? See how this is higher and this is lower. And you're going to look at the PP max. So you're going to take, this is going to be systolic PP max. This is going to be diastolic PP max. And you're going to subtract those. Then you're going to look at PP min. So this is going to be systolic PP min. We use the same N, our bad. Uh, this is going to be diastolic PP min. And you're going to subtract those. And the formula you then use are going to be PP max minus PP min divided by PP max plus PP min divided by two times 100 because it's going to be a percent. This is obviously a bulky equation. The nice thing is there are some um, machines that will do this for you, which is going to make it a lot more accurate than you kind of looking on the A-line tracing and trying to see what's the systolic, you know, PP max, diastolic PP max, systolic PP min, diastolic PP min. Let me plug it into this equation. I mean, you could obviously do that, but there are some um, setups that will calculate this for you automatically, which will make it a lot more accurate for you. You then will average this across two to three cycles just to ensure that there's some stability there. And then as we said, there's some modern calculators that'll do this for you automatically. We do just want to briefly mention the title volume challenge. As we talked about, we'll talk about what normal and abnormal is for the number itself. But the title volume challenge is if they're on lower title volumes and you think their lungs can tolerate it, increase them to that eight cc's per kg of ideal body weight. Do it for about a minute and then use that to actually calculate your pulse pressure variation using the equation above. All right. Then go back to your normal title volume you had them on. So how do you use pulse pressure variation? Well, there's a couple thresholds here and they're percentages, right? Because you're calculating a percentage. So a pulse pressure variation that's above 13% means they're likely fluid responsive, right? Higher numbers equals more likely fluid responsive. Whereas a pulse pressure, uh, pulse pressure variation of less than 9% means they're most likely not fluid responsive. It's low. They're not fluid responsive. And then a pulse pressure variation of 9 to 13% is kind of like the gray zone. Uh, you can't really make a good measurement or a definite answer to whether they're fluid or not fluid responsive. And hopefully this makes sense, right? So higher pulse pressure variation means there's more variability with high intrathoracic pressure in what the systolic and diastolic blood pressure is. So when you have high intrathoracic pressure, the systolic and diastolic drop because you have less venous return to the heart. Whereas, and that implies that you need that venous return to the heart to have the higher blood pressure because when you took it away, the pressure dropped and that's gonna lead to a higher pulse pressure variation, which means they're most likely fluid responsive. Whereas if you increase the intrathoracic pressure and nothing really happens to the blood pressure, it doesn't drop that much. It means they're probably not fluid responsive because decreasing that venous return or increasing it didn't really change what the actual blood pressure was. So clinical actions here, if they have a high pulse pressure, consider fluid bolus and you know reevaluate. If they have a low pulse pressure variation, sorry, high pulse pressure variation, consider fluid bolus. If they have a low pulse pressure variation, fluids are unlikely to help. And if you're in the gray zone, you'll have to think about some other stuff, right? We uh, have videos out on passive leg raise and IVC assessments and CVPs and all this other stuff. So you'll have to think about clinical context more. Um, and remember that high pulse pressure variation is going to be greater than 13%. That low pulse pr pressure variation is going to be less than 9%. And the gray zone is going to be that 9 to 13%. So strengths of this measurement, it is a better predictor of fluid responsiveness than some of the static indices, because this is dynamic. You're actually watching the A-line tracing over time, right, with respiratory breaths, where something like CVP or even pulmonary artery occlusion pressure, aka pulmonary capillary wedge pressure from a Swan-Gans catheter, those are static indices. You just get the number one time, and certainly you could repeat that number, um, but it's not like pulse pressure variation where you're actually watching a waveform over time. Um, it's continuous. You can do it continuously. It's real time. Um, you just need an A-line and obviously someone to fit all those criteria on the vent.
And it's simple to use, um, especially if you have one of the setups that can calculate it for you. Helps reduce unnecessary fluids, um, and it's a fairly good measure of fluid responsiveness. Pitfalls and when pulse pressure variation is less accurate. Well, like we talked about, there's lots of things that make it not reliable. And those things include, we're going to say them again, we're just going to keep beating it over and over. Uh, if a patient is spontaneously breathing, not helpful. If they have arrhythmias, not helpful. If they're on low tidal volume, not helpful. If they have poor lung compliance, that can sometimes throw the number off. Certainly if they have RV failure, pulmonary hypertension, or increased intra-abdominal pressures, all these things can make the number less accurate. Open chest, prone positioning, one lung ventilation, or an A-line waveform that's dampened or has a bunch of artifact. So tons of things here, tons of things can make this less reliable, which again is why it's not some magic you know, number that we get on every single patient um, because you kind of need the perfect scenario to make this a reliable measurement. All right, evidence snapshot. We're getting towards the end here. Um, so the studies that have looked at this have been a handful, right? There's been some meta-analyses that have looked at pulse pressure variation, um, also stroke volume variation, but for this uh, episode, we're talking about pulse pressure variation. And they have found that they outperform those static indices in predicting fluid responsiveness, right? That CVP, that pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, those types of things. ICU studies show that the accuracy does hinge on those really controlled settings. You need adequate tidal volume, sinus rhythm, no spontaneous breathing. So those are critical, critical, critical. We can't say it enough. Guidelines like surviving sepsis campaign do endorse dynamic variables like pulse pressure variation for whatever that's worth. Um, and then adjuncts should be used when pulse pressure variation is not uh, within kind of all those strict criteria for accuracy. So quick bedside algorithm, you can confirm the prerequisites. They're on event, they're in sinus rhythm, they're on adequate tidal volume. Measure their pulse pressure variation. If it's more than 13%, it's likely that they're fluid responsive. It's, if it's less than 9%, it's unlikely that they're fluid responsive. And it's in the gray zone, you're back at square one, okay? And then obviously it's the ICU. So reassess, reassess, reassess. None of the things that are in the ICU are said and forget it. Everything is reassess. All right, let's dive in some practice questions. See if we have mastered the basics of pulse pressure variation. For those of you that have not seen uh, the way we do practice questions, um, we will read the question, read the answer options, and then go into the answer. So if you need more time to think about it, you should pause the episode because we'll go right into the actual answer. All right, beginner question. A patient on controlled ventilation has a PP max of 50, a PP min of 30. What is the pulse pressure variation? Maybe for this one, we'll do the math with you all. So we said pulse pressure variation is PP max minus PP min over PP max plus PP min divided by 2 times 100. Okay, so let's do it together. 50 minus 30, which equals 20. Hopefully we do our math right. 50 plus 30 divided by 2, which is going to be 80 divided by 2, which equals 40. If you do that, that's going to be 0.5 times 100. So the answer should be, hopefully we're right, Perfect. C, 50%. And this would imply they are fluid responsive or not fluid responsive. Yes, because it's greater than the 13%. Cool. Okay, question number two, intermediate. A 60-year-old septic patient ventilated at 8 cc's per kg has a pulse pressure variation of 16% while in sinus rhythm. What is the best next step? A, give 250 cc's of crystalloid with continued monitoring. B, increase their norepinephrine for hypotension. C, assume they're not fluid responsive. Or D, switch to pressure support ventilation. All right, the answer is A, right? Because their pulse pressure variation is greater than 13%, which implies they're probably fluid responsive. So try a small volume bolus and keep monitoring. Last question, advance. A 52-year-old woman with ARDS on 6 cc's per tidal volume has a pulse pressure variation of 12%. She's deeply sedated and in sinus rhythm. What is the most evidence-based next maneuver? A, give one liter of crystalloid empirically. B, perform passive leg raise with cardiac output monitoring. C, increase their FiO2 to 100%. Or D, give a do test dose of dobutamine. The answer is... B, perform passive leg raise. And the reason for this is because they're on 8 cc's per kg. So this is going to be inaccurate pulse pressure variation. And since they're in ARDS, you don't really want to increase their tidal volume as that can cause more uh, lung damage. All right, that's all we have for you today. Thanks for checking it out. Again, if you want this study guide, check out our Patreon page. Also, we have a YouTube and podcast platform, so check those out. All of it is linked in the episode description. Uh, let us know what thoughts, comments, questions you have. And either way, stay well, keep learning, 
We'll see you all next time.